Hello, everyone. This is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast here on newdiscourses.com. And what I'm going to do this time is something a little bit different. For those of you who don't know, I have an alternative podcast that I keep usually for subscribers and supporters only, contributors to the site who keep me going, keep the lights on and all of that, called James Lindsay Only Subs. And what I do in those is I just kind of talk off the cuff about something that I'm interested in and I don't really plan them and it's a little bit more intimate and personal and it's a little bit more just out of my head rather than some kind of like planned podcast. And I was going to do this episode that I'm recording now as a James Lindsay only subs. And then I thought, no, it's just actually really important. I want to get it out there as a, as a full new discourses podcast for everybody, for the public. But I also don't want to change the way I feel. I'm going to deliver it by planning it out in detail. So this should give you a little bit of feel for how the James Lindsay only subs podcasts go. They tend to be a little shorter. I think this one will, we'll see what happens. I think this will be shorter than my usual. I will get back to reading through Herbert Marcuse's essay on liberation soon. It's very important that we get through that and finish it. But what I want to do is kind of dive into what's actually happening in our schools and why good liberals, and I mean that in the classically liberal sense, keep getting their asses whipped by things that are shaped like communism, whether that's Marxism, neo-Marxism, postmodernism, wokeism, but it's not as much postmodernism, but really this new woke thing in particular in the neo-Marxism, the cultural Marxism that we saw preceding this. Um, liberals are very susceptible to this, and obviously the reactionary right has picked up on this, and they like to try to identify and I think this is very important because a backlash to wokeness is coming. And I think it's very important that we think about how we want to get go forward toward when, when that backlash begins. We want this, I will tell you, to be as liberal as possible because illiberal currents are going to happen within it and we want to minimize those. And the reactionaries have noticed, if you haven't figured it out, that wokeness is a problem and they want to go to war with it. And they fully will. And if they're the only ones speaking truth into this domain, they're going to gain a big following. So we need liberal voices who aren't afraid to mince words. And frankly, there aren't that many of us out there. There are actually very few of us. And this isn't a left versus right or what Americans call liberals versus conservative discussion. This is classical liberals versus illiberalism. This is individual rights versus kind of collectivism or monarchy or whatever. This is modernism versus pre-modernism and post-modernism. Uh, kind of as two sides of the same illiberal coin. And what the neo-reaction folks have started to make a case for, and they've been very effective in certain conservative circles, especially the disaffected youth are very um, drawn to this, I think because they sense that we live in a very Baudrillardian word, world, not to get too deep into things <laughs> philosophically too fast, but we live in a world that feels very hyper real. It's very difficult to know what meaning is. It's a very Derridian world. Meaning has been hollowed out. Baudrillardian world, it feels like we live in the matrix. Those are kind of easy ways to understand what's meant by Derridian and Baudrillardian in this case. I know inv invoking French philosophers. And so it's very appealing to them. Uh, you, you, you have, for example, I think her name is something like Alex Katsuda or something like that is, is one of these people and I refer to as a Pomo trad, a traditionalist but a postmodern traditionalist. And that's because she talked about how traditional values are LARP, L-A-R-P, live action role playing. In other words, they are performative. And that's a very Baudrillardian way to look at values. It's also very Derridian in that the value, that the idea has been, the, the, the meaning has been hollowed out. It's also very Foucauldian in the idea that power is really all that matters. And they say things in the neo-reaction crowd like that, um, that, that, it, basically rights are a social construct. Liberty is a social construct and that power is really what it's all about. And they're very, very interested, just like the neo-Marxists were in figuring out how to analyze and seize power. And I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's going to be what anybody wants. Once we get a little bit down that road, you can say that they're based and they do say some based things and they do have some good analysis philosophically, but I think they take the wrong road. And so what I want to do is I want to explain, A, what's going on in things like our schools and also more widely, and B, why good classically liberal-minded people, people who believe in things like individualism, enlightenment rationalism, equality before the law, rule of law, uh, neutrality, 
uh, race neutral policy or so called color blindness. Some people are recommending the phrase color indifference instead of color blindness to get around the linguistic manipulations of the woke. Uh, a constitutional law republicanism in terms of how governments are organized as opposed to raw democracy or something like this. And certainly not collectivist or communist, very individual rights oriented. You know, the belief, for example, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm reading this, by the way, on the 4th of July on American Independence Day, when these words were first released out into the public in 1776 um, in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote and uh, many people signed in 1776. And so I'm re reading this on the, what is it, the 200 and math 45th or something like that anniversary of those words putting put out into the public for the first time. And those people get owned by communist manipulations, woke manipulations included, um, because they are able to, they, they fall for the abuse of power that comes along with abu abusive language. And we can actually tie this up into a neat bow that explains what's actually happening, for example, in the schools. They say, we aren't teaching critical race theory. We kind of see that's a lie now, though, right? Because just like two days ago, at the time of this recording, the National Education what is it, Association, NEA, came out and said that they're going to make sure to push for critical race theory to be in every school district, all 14,000 plus of them in the United States, in every one of the 50 states. So the, the lie that they haven't been teaching critical race theory and don't want to teach critical race theory, excuse me, critical race theory has fallen apart by their own admission. But nevertheless, we've just endured weeks of being gaslit and told, oh, there's critical race theory is not even in our schools. We still hear people making the argument that it's a law school thing. It's, it's not suitable for K through 12. And there's something to unpack here so that people can understand. When we understand this, we'll also understand why good classical liberals who want to live everywhere in the marketplace of ideas keep losing to these people. Why we've steadily lost these institutions to these manipulations over the past 50 years, these neo-Marxist, to be very specific, manipulations over the last 50 years. And it's easy to say, oh, well, there's certain psychological traits. Or if you're a neo-reaction, you'll say that it is a natural consequence of liberalism, communism grows out of liberalism, that, con that communism is just like the next step of liberalism or wokeism is the next step of liberalism. And of course, it's going to happen. It's a necessary consequence. And I don't believe that for a second, by the way. And I don't think you should either. And it's a very pessimistic and dim view that very poorly understands individual rights and very poorly understands the strengths of liberalism and blames liberalism for being something it was never meant to be. Liberalism isn't meant to give you meaning, by the way. I want to do a podcast about this at some point, too. Liberalism is meant to give you the opportunity to choose your own path to meaning and not have it forced upon you by a state or a church or any other thing. So if you look to liberalism for meaning, of course, you're going to come up empty. It's not meant to do that. It's meant to offer you the opportunity to find it where you want. This basic misunderstanding of liberalism causes them to think these things. And so... Um, there are a lot of different ways, though, that people can think about, uh, you know, why liberalism has been susceptible. And I think it's actually very simple. It's I don't think it's psychological traits. I don't think that it's um, that people are too afraid to say no. I think that it is obviously a problem. People have become comfortable. People have believed this that it couldn't happen here. People have believed that the threats of tremendously illiberal and totalitarian environments died out when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, when Francis Fukuyama wrote The End of History, which is a very oddly um, Hegelian phrase, by the way. We could talk about how Hegelian philosophy has kind of insinuated itself throughout liberalism over the past couple hundred years. There's lots of things we could talk about, but I don't think it, it comes down to any of that. I think it comes down to something much more simple. And it explains what's actually going on in our schools and why it's going on in our schools and why we all feel gaslit to hear critical race theory is not in our schools. And that is that critical theories by definition, this is by definition, require something called praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, which is a word if you're a normal person that you probably haven't encountered a lot because normal people don't use this. But if you have encountered it, you probably read it in some kind of a jargony thing most likely in education, that said it is very important to, quote, wed theory to praxis. 
As far as I know, and I haven't traced the word back further than this, so it might have a longer history than this, but I do know that, ma- that praxis is a Marxist word that very likely originated with Marx. Uh, it is the idea of putting into practice or putting into application some theoretical construct to try to bring it about in the world. So when Marx said that, you know, philosophers have hitherto only sought to understand the world, the point is to change it. He was talking about doing praxis. Praxis is considered to be a reflective activity. You have to reflect upon what you're doing. That's why they think that they're never wrong. They think they're constantly reflecting. But what they're actually doing is constantly comparing it against their own set of preconceived presuppositions and biases. But they think that they're constantly reflecting on what they're doing. And so because they think that they're very reflective and that they're engaging in, in frankly, speculative philosophy about how society should be and reflecting uh, on that, they believe that they're never wrong. It's also critical. So when Robin D'Angelo, by the way, says, and she says this often and has said this often, that anti-racism is a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism, what she's saying is that we have to do praxis. If you read Paulo Freire, uh, the critical pedagogy guy from the 1960s and 70s from Brazil, um, he constantly talks about the need to turn education into praxis. You, it's not enough to teach about oppression. You have to teach people to feel their oppression. You have to awaken a critical consciousness. Praxis is about awakening a new consciousness. In other words, as when I say it's not indoctrination, it's reprogramming or just programming if it's children. That's what I'm talking about. Praxis is required. If we go back to Max Horkheimer, for example, within the critical theory school of thought, the guy who named critical theory, which isn't that creative because he named it off of Marx's critical philosophy, which derived ultimately from both Hegel's, but more importantly, Kant's critical philosophy. This is, it's like, it's not a totally new term to him, but critical theory comes into being and he separates that from traditional theories, which are concerned with understanding the world as it is, whereas critical theories are concerned with changing the world according to a vision. And a critical theory, according to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and their entry on critical theory, must contain three elements, according to Horkheimer. Now, I've read the original essay. It's long. It's not so neatly delineated in traditional and critical theory, which was written in 1937 by Horkheimer, as it is when you read uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which boils it down and makes it clear. But they say it requires, a, a critical theory requires, at a minimum, three elements. Three components must be there. Number one, it must hold an idealized vision of society, which I would tell you is a utopia. As a matter of fact, that's why this is a Gnostic religion. It has a vision of that utopia in mind. It knows what it looks like and it knows how to get there. So it thinks. It has special knowledge that's only understandable when you have the proper consciousness. That's Gnosticism. If That's an aside. Secondly, It must be able to explain why the existing society does not live up to that idealized vision and why it's not necessarily going there on its own. So we have two components. This is when they say we're not teaching critical theory or critical race theory. These two components could be taught as ideas. Okay. These two components could be taught as ideas. You could teach about a utopian vision for society and why the society doesn't live up to that. They usually summarize that in a nicer package to say it's looking for assumptions that haven't been examined properly, hidden assumptions, who benefits, what are the biases, or it's it's looking for uh, problematics, the things that people take for granted, but they're actually a problem. They actually cause problems, which are what in um, Marxist theory they would call the contradictions, or Hegelian theory they would call the contradictions. When Lenin said accelerate the contradictions, he was saying make more of these problems basically to generate more revolutionary consciousness. And that's sort of Freire's whole stick, and that's why he quotes Lenin about his plan in education. This is all coming together very clearly now. But the third component, there was only two components of a critical theory, and the third component is that it must have praxis. Or, in other words, as it's on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it must inspire social activism in order to bring about that idealized state of the world. Praxis, that lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of 
self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism on behalf of the theory and, according to Robin D'Angelo and others, no one is ever done. Praxis. The entire book of Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Ferreri is just about the need for praxis, that teaching theory is not enough. You have to have praxis, that if you try to just take a theory from one context, say the Brazilian uh, 1960s, and transmogrify it over into the American context in the 1990s, it's not going to work. It has to fit the new context. It has to be remade. Freire was very clear. Don't just copy my theories, try to apply them. They won't work. It has to be remade in its own context, and it has to be done so through praxis. One of Paulo Freire's lunatic followers, Henry Giroux, talks about how he got a hundred, in one of his one of his uh, books, he talks about how he got 100 critical theory-based educators into tenured positions in colleges of education as a praxis for critical pedagogy in order to bring critical pedagogy into the world. And you have to understand this. I just read an article from my friend Pamela Perezki. She's wonderful. She says, yes, we must teach critical race theory, but she's wrong. We must not teach critical race theory because to teach critical race theory means to bring in critical race praxis. And seeing her article Plus the arguments I'm having with my other, my other good liberal friends, and you're welcome to guess it to who those people are. Um, they don't. Good liberals think everything's friggin' ideas, and Marxists don't. Marxists think there must be praxis. It must be implemented. You can't teach critical race theory without implementing critical race theory, because if you do, it's not authentic. You have to understand that. And liberals tend not to understand that. They think, oh, perfect idea land. We can just argue about the ideas. We can discuss it. We will convince them in the battleground of ideas. We'll get in the marketplace and see which ideas have better traction. No. And this isn't the, the neo reaction people aren't right either. It's not that liberalism gr produces communism, it's that liberals who think, who are so deep into liberal respectability, they think that everything just comes down to arguments about, about ideas, so they are completely on their heels and completely defenseless against people who are doing praxis. And praxis is a necessary component of a critical theory. So what's happening in our schools is critical race praxis, critical pedagogy praxis, queer theory praxis. They're putting it into implementation. It's a slightly different thing, but because the theory requires the practice, Praxis is an integral part. It cannot be removed. If you took the praxis out of critical theory, it's no longer a critical theory. If all you're doing is critique, it's no longer a critical theory. You have to have praxis included. And once you put the praxis in, now you're implementing it. That's what's actually happening. They might teach some ideas that are derived from critical theory. Critical pedagogy is being put into practice. It is the critical pedagogy praxis is what's happening in our schools. Critical race Praxis is happening in our schools. This is what's going on in our schools. You don't teach the theory necessarily to fourth graders. You teach the theory to educators who are then taught that they must put it into praxis or they aren't doing it correctly. They aren't doing what it's supposed to do. And they are going to go put it into practice as praxis in the schools in the boardroom, in HR departments, in the government, in the military, anywhere they can get their hands. That's what Women's Studies as a Virus, which I read recently on this podcast, is all about. Anywhere they can stick that praxis in, they're going to, like a virus. And the reason that liberalism gives way to this and falls prey to this when people aren't vigilant for it is they think they can argue about the ideas, and they can all day long. But they're arguing with people who are utterly, at the best, utterly convicted to those ideas. They will not have their minds changed. At the worst, they're arguing with liars and manipulators who don't care what's true at all. And they're just going to say whatever they have to say so they can continue to do the praxis that's demanded of them. That is a religious commandment in critical theories, and you must think of it as a religious commandment. It's the same religious commandment, though perverse, that Christians have in evangelizing. It's the exact same thing. The Christians are commanded to go by their gospel, to go and spread, but maybe by Paul, I'm not that up on my theology, one or the other, to go and spread the gospel, to spread the good news. Critical theorists are required by the definition of a critical theory to do praxis, to implement and spread the theory, to awaken a critical consciousness, to reprogram the people they encounter, to think like they think. It's not exactly, I'm not trying to compare it to Christianity, don't get me wrong. It's the same 
impulse, however, as evangelism. It's exactly the same impulse. And if you take it out, you're not doing critical theory anymore. So these people who are programmed critical theorists at the level of being educators or HR department operators or whatever they are must do critical praxis. They must, or they're not satisfying their religious duty that they have taken upon themselves by falling into the critical religion. And that's what's happening in our schools. The implementation goes with the theory and liberals cannot see the implementation happening or have nothing to do to stop it because they're too busy arguing the ideas. And this works out to the advantage of people who want to play this little game. The, the communists, Marxists and neo-Marxists, whatever, I'm using communists in a very broad sense here. They mean all of these from, from neo-Marxists, cultural Marxists, regular Marxists, uh, all the way up through the woke, which are some weird fusion of all of this. And again, the postmodernists are a little bit different. They're technically post-Marxists. Is a little, they're they're a little bit too pessimistic. It's a little different there. But the point is that this line of thought is able to manipulate liberals very effectively by getting them to argue about stuff that's all superficial. All that matters is the consciousness raising. That's the heart. That's all. That's the heart of the religion is raise the consciousness, raise the critical consciousness. The theory. Whatever it is, whether it's queer theory, whether it's cultural Marxism, whether it's neo-Marxism, whether it's traditional so-called vulgar Marxism, whatever it is, the theory exists merely to service the praxis, which is to awaken a consciousness to get them to be critical theorists, to complain about how society is not an ideal utopia. And this vision that they hold up that's usually called communism, although we often hear it called liberation, or Marcuse refers to it as a liberated socialism which is socialism without the bureaucracies. This is what they're doing. This is what they're up to. And it's perfectly to their advantage. It's so parasitic on liberal values because they can always convince liberals that to be ethical and smart and, and genuine to their own tradition, that they must engage in the argument about the ideas. But the ideas are or throw away. It's the praxis that matters. It is to find some way, one way or another, to take a person, especially if they can, a child in the schools, and get them to see the world in their perverted, upside-down, inverted way. That's it. Everything else is throw away with the whole ideology. That's why I get so frustrated having to talk about the details of critical race theory or the details of queer theory, because the second we expose it and, and show exactly what it is and convince a lot of people of exactly what it is, the thing's just going to change. Because that's irrelevant. The praxis is what's relevant. The critical praxis this is like where Snape says that the dark arts are ever changing and invincible and blah, blah, blah. And he waxes all eloquent. Critical theory is like the dark arts. I put that on Twitter recently. I don't have the quote in front of me, but you know what I'm talking about, where Snape has that whole thing in Harry Potter. I'm going to do a podcast sooner or later about Harry Potter because I think that Rowling, despite her woke, sometimes woke proclivities, stumbled upon the essential argument against all of this stuff. Uh, and put it in a beautiful form in the books of Harry Potter. But that's another podcast for another day. Just like the rest of Essay on Liberation, it's another pod three podcasts for another three days. And whatever else I've mentioned are other podcasts for other days. But this is the key thing I want people to take away then. One, liberalism does not lead inexorably to communism. The neo-reaction people are wrong and their solution, that's their analysis going wrong. Their belief that everything comes down to power is wrong and their uh, solutions are therefore not just wrong, but dangerously wrong. And as far as the Pomo trad side, the postmodern Baudrillardian LARP traditional values, that's disgusting. We need real values. Real values are the, are the kryptonite to this stuff, not pretending we have values that run in opposite to uh, what the woke are peddling. It's the same problem under a different guise, if we get that wrong. But communism, et cetera, Marxism, neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, woke Marxism, don't grow out of liberalism. They are not a necessary consequence of liberalism. They are a very effective parasite because they get liberals to argue about ideas that are actually unimportant. The ideas don't matter. The point is to awaken a consciousness. The point is to do praxis. And liberals who are kind of very, I, as I am, very John Stuart Mill based in their thought that, oh, we need to hear the argument. We need to argue the argument back. We need to make the best arguments back against it. To a degree, that's true. To a degree, that's true. But it's only to a degree. And liberals get caught in this tornado of this without recognizing that we actually have to understand 
that we are dealing with power-obsessed people who are using the arguments to keep us busy while they implement the stuff everywhere everywhere else. And if we're not willing to take every legal step to unimplement it, then we just keep losing ground. We just keep losing. It's not about paying attention to their arguments. They don't care about their arguments either. And I know that's a very you know, broad stroke statement to make. It doesn't apply to every single one. Lots of these people are very sincere and they're caught up in it, but I'm talking about the ideology as a whole does not care about its specific arguments. The individuals that are caught up in it might, but watch how they'll change on a dime. Watch, just watch. We, we, we've exposed critical race theory. We'll see what happens now. It's only going to last for so long where they can try to peddle this crap. They tried, it's not in our schools. That didn't work. Now they're saying it's, you know, we have to have it to teach real history. That's not going to work either. Everybody knows who's even bothered to look at the Wikipedia entry or anything else that's been written about critical race theory in the past year, at least that it favors cultural revi- or sorry, historical revisionism as an explicit methodology. That's what the 1619 project is. It explicitly rewrites history to match its claims about history so that it can use them for politics. It's explicitly politically revisionist. It's proudly politically revisionist. And it tries to make this claim that, well, we already have revisionist history. It's a lame claim it makes in every domain. We already have racial environments. So of course, we have to ra- look like we're racializing things because they're already racialized. We already have segregated environments. So of course, it looks like we have to segregate because uh, we actually already have a segregated environment. It just looks like we are. Other people already did. And then the same thing here. Of course, we have to do revisionist history because we already have revisionist history and if we don't write this we can't have the true history it's the same tired sorry argument and then you know you get bogged down you spend it takes 10 times or 100 times as much effort to to take apart their bullshit as it does for them to spout their bullshit so they can spout their bullshit and then go in on a huge implementation push while you spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours untangling it for a small audience that isn't even the one that they're targeting to try to implement it upon do you see how it works And that's the trick. That's how they keep getting good liberals. Not to necessarily carry water for them. That's a very smart people problem. It's its own problem. But to be ineffective at fighting back against it because they are too busy arguing the ideas and unwilling to try to take a real step to stop the implementation that's already happening under praxis, which is a required part of the theory. And they won't take that step because they know that the woke or the Marxist or the Neo-Marxists or the cultural market, whoever it is, these communists in general, are going to very effectively point out their hypocrisy and other people who are in their liberal, cultural, and social group who don't know this manipulation are going to think, oh, what a hypocrite. Oh, and here's a great example of that. You know, you say we should fire this person who's abusing their power, or maybe children, with their wokeness. You should fire them. And they come out and say, oh, I thought you were against cancel culture. Do you see how the game works? The second you try to stop their implementation, they lose their marbles and they start accusing you of things. And then, of course, you can always count on a bunch of good liberals who are so concerned with what other people are going to think about their total fidelity to what appears to be liberal values to stop them from taking the steps to stop the implementation. So they preserve praxis, which is what they're really after. This is why Kimberly Crenshaw says intersectionality and critical race theory are a practice, by the way, not a theory, a practice, because they must be rooted in praxis. And the praxis is what actually matters. The praxis is linked to the theory, but if they can keep liberals arguing about the theory, they can keep doing the praxis and keep implementing it. And the liberals have no real way to stand up and stop it because they're so afraid of getting called a hypocrite or something of that kind if they get called out. This is necessary to understand if you want to fight back against wokeness because it also is going to tell you that it's absolutely unequivocally necessary. Unlike what people are arguing, it is unequivocally necessary to remove their ability to do praxis. Whatever that looks like, whether that's banning it from schools, whatever the correct form is, but that's the eye, the ball your eye has to be on is how do you forget the theory? How do you stop them from implementing the raising of consciousness? That is the thing to do and to do relentlessly and to do by every legal means that you can find in every domain you can find it. How do you stop the praxis? Screw the theory. <laughs>